Hello everyone and welcome to the Hidden Lives of Writers. My name is Fiona Snickers and I'm joined by my co-host Gail Schimmel. Hello Fiona. Hi Gail. How have things been going since last we spoke? How has your writing week been? So finally I've been able to put put the one book aside and get into a book I had started before I did the edits on my last book. This is a confusing sentence. Sorry <laughs> listeners. Um, but it's been interesting coming back to a book that you've written a bit of, mm-hmm. had to leave and then come back. And I've been so excited to come back. And I realized that I left at a very good point where a section was over. Yeah. But I'm not really sure what happens next in this book. And I've got to get back into that world and figure out where I'm going next in this book. So it's been fun, but more challenging than I thought it would be. And your writing week? I just wanted to ask whether you do this thing that I do when you break off, either just for the day or when you know you are going to be taking Mm. a substantial break. Do you write a couple of notes for yourself just to remind yourself where you saw this narrative going? So I have been doing with this newest book a lot of headlighting where I mm-hmm. plan a few chapters in advance. So I don't, I know how the book's going to end as I always do, but I've been headlighting and writing a few chapters. So up to the point where it breaks, I've done a few chapters in advance. So I have mm-hmm. those notes. I don't write anything in the book usually. Mm-hmm. Occasionally I'll write one or two words. I'm a big believer in breaking while you're in the flow. Yes. So, don't write every idea you have. And then if you break in the flow, you do sometimes need to write where your flow was going in case you completely lose it, especially if you have a memory like mine. <laughs> Speaking of bad memories, <gasps> I found after taking a bit of a break and coming back to a manuscript that when I was reading over what I'd written, I'd written something based on what I can only describe as very superficial research, i.e. I'd done some Googling. And I'd written stuff down on the basis of that. And I just want to warn people about the perils of that because I came back to it and it was as though a stranger had written it. I had no memory of it. It was such shallow knowledge. It had made so little impression on me that it, it was just unshaky ground to carry on with. I had to stop, delete that, go back and acquaint myself properly with the material rewrite it and then carry on on a more solid foundation. Very interesting. Very, very. I mean, I'm a great fan of the quick Google research. We all know I'm far too lazy to do proper research, but that's why I don't write historical novels or anything like that. Yeah, I think this was a a sort of medical thing where Ah. I had done a a quick Google and went back and looked at it and thought, "Mm, none of that actually sounds right. (laughs) And then when I went into it more closely, I realized that I I had misunderstood something and that I just need to be a bit more careful with my research. Very interesting and a good lesson. Yes, indeed. Uh, So what have you been filling up the well with? What have you been consuming lately? So because I am writing a thriller, I'm reading a lot of thrillers. Mm -hmm. And what's been a really interesting thing for me is I've read a few thrillers recently, about four very recently, where two were crap Mm -hmm. and two were good. Right. And the question is, what is the difference? Yes. And what was very interesting for me is it's not the originality of the plot. Right. So I read one called The Forgetting by Hannah Beckerman. And it uses the trope, and I say this with the greatest respect because I have written a book using this trope, of memory loss. Right. But it it is more tropish, I hope, than what I have written about memory loss. It uses a, quite a tired trope about memory loss. I don't want to say because it, it does give away the plot. But it's written so skillfully that I didn't care that it was a tired trope. I didn't care that I saw every twist coming with an alarm on its head from 10 miles away. Mm -hmm. But still, I was gripped by the book. Right. And then the other one I want to talk about, The Last Time by Heidi Perks, who I'm delighted to have discovered, this this author. She has a big backlist. I haven't read her. And also, not quite as tired a trope, but I could see the twists coming. It, It was not madly original writing, but I was gripped. And so what's interesting to me is with thrillers, it does seem to be about the quality of keeping the reader gripped rather than 
killing yourself to come up with a madly original idea that nobody's going to see your twist coming at all. Right. It's about quality, not quality in the literary sense, because thrillers are never literary fiction or very seldom literary fiction. Right. But just keeping you gripped that all you want to do is get back to that book. And both of these books were. So that's The Forgetting and For the Last Time. And Fiona, what have you been consuming? Well, my daughter recently read um, Kazuo Ishiguro's Remains of the Day, mm. which I had never read, and I'd also never seen the movie. And she was raving about it, and I realized this was a gap in my literary education. A lacuna, one could say. <laughs> one could say that. <laughs> <laughs> and I went back and I read it, and wow, what yes. a book. There's a reason why it's a modern classic. Yes. It was just – it. it it taught me stuff. It was an education in the finest of fine writing and character development. And so if any members of our audience have skipped that one in their yeah. reading journey, just go back and read it. It's short. Um, it's very accessible. And um, I am going to watch the movie now as well. But just that book exquisite. Absolutely. It's a book I used to reread a lot. Obviously, now I can't remember what it's about because I have a memory problem. But um I used to reread it a lot. I can read anything he writes. Yeah. I read The Consoled. Mm -hmm. I couldn't make head or tail of it. And I, to this day, I have no clue what that book's about, but he writes so beautifully, I didn't care that I didn't know what was going on. I find he veers between very accessibly plotted books mm -hmm. and then quite obscurely plotted books um, and quite different reading experiences. He, he writes widely different genres. There's that sci-fi one that he wrote, um, Clara and two, the Sun. Two Clara and the Sun and another one right. about about cloning people. Okay. Um, but he writes different genres, but everything he writes I love. One yeah. of those writers that I will read the first as soon as it hits the shelves. Yeah, no, I agree. I quite agree. Our guest today is also someone who writes in different genres, and we're looking forward to chatting to her about that. So excited about this one. Our guest today is Shafinaz Hassim. Shafinaz is a sociologist and writer. She is the author of Daughters Are Diamonds, Memoirs for Kimya, Sophia, the Nisa Kamar series of books for children, uh, the novel The Economics of Love and Happiness, and a collection of short stories called The Pink Oysters, Shafinaz was shortlisted for the UJ Creative Writing Prize and also for the K. Sello Deka Award. Hi, Shafinaz, and welcome. So wonderful to be on the show. Um, I've been listening in on some, and so it's great to be here finally. That's so exciting to hear. It's nice having guests who've listened to the podcast, and I think that's something that's only happening now that, that we kind of into season three and people are no, know about it. I'm loving this. <laughs> <laughs> Shafinaz, what has your writing week been like? Well, I've been moving house, um, but it actually helps me feel centered if I can just jot down and keep a few notes together. Um, and after completing Darlings and having quite a crazy 2023, I think I've just been feeling like there's this new idea coming about. And even though I've been trying to do book five in Nisa Kamar, it's been stagnated. So I have notes for a new idea and um, I'm exploring, I think, some of my own childhood memories mm -hmm. um, and developing a new character. It's very early stages, probably about two or three thousand words that have got down in an idea. So let's see how that pans out for the rest of of this year, something to keep me going. So when you write ideas, I, I'm, I'm quite interested that you said two or three thousand words for the idea. So you do you write notes or like quite? That's quite a lot of notes on an idea. When I write not notes on an idea, it's like five key words. Um, so talk us through that process. How much do you write before you write? I find um, I, I, I'm a bit of an overwriter in that sense. And I think it comes from the academic side of just trying to get everything that I feel must happen into the story um, and develop much of a, you know, the way one would, would eventually write a synopsis. In the past, I would develop my characters and carefully flash them out. Um, but now I see these, these visuals of who and what my character is and where they're going. And, and then there's kind of theoreticizing because I'm writing about either, um, gender-based violence or human trafficking. I'm bringing in some of the data they've already, um, received. 
And once in, once I start doing that, it just becomes this abstract that becomes something. So obviously that just forms um, the initial idea. None of that's actually going to make it into the book necessarily. And then once I start developing my character and it, it grows not necessarily organically, it tends to take its own its own route, a life of its own. And then I find I've deviated from what I imagined would happen. But that's, I find, a nice starting point just to get me seeing where it's going in terms of intent and content. Right. And would you say that character is your starting point? Do you have a character in mind and then the story comes or vice versa? I think I have an intention in mind because Mm -hmm. I want to, for a lot of my work, starting off with Daughters of Diamonds was about documenting research data. And it's always been in the back of my mind that I want to um, talk about certain issues using fiction as the vehicle. And and um, unfortunately, perhaps, I haven't started out using fiction for entertainment. And this is why Darlings is so different. It was such a stretch for me to write something like Darlings. Um, so I've been a bit of, uh, you know, a bit of, I started off a little more snobbish in my writing and I hope I've broken out of that, <laughs> that mold. Um, because I find that, uh, fiction is a very beautiful way of, of engaging audiences around sometimes serious matters. And, um, and I've also realized that I don't have to have this intention in mind that I have to be writing about GBV or I have to be writing about a specific topic in order to get the message out, but that I really have to just have a feel for characters. And it took me a long time to come to that realization, um, to just really feel the emotion of the character and feel that person go through whatever they're going through. Um, I think it was more difficult for me as a younger writer, and I'm hoping I'm, you know, sort of got my foot in the door with it now. Which I think is we've we've almost skipped our usual first thing, and I think a lot of what you're saying relates to this, which is if you could tell us a little bit about your origin story. You, you're a sociologist um, by profession. Um, to, if you can explain to us exactly, because while I think I know what that means, I'm not entirely sure I do know what that means. So if you could explain that and then how you came to writing. So um, I uh, looked at, I'm an identity theorist, and I looked at my research back, almost 20 years ago, um, where there wasn't a lot documented about um, the dynamic of Muslim women in South Africa. There was a lot of sort of global focus, international focus. Um, and I felt at the time like I wasn't reading not just in the fiction fictional space, but I wasn't reading a lot that made me feel at home in our literary spaces, in our academic spaces, um, in a sense of understanding where I came from, what the clan uh, familiarity was and how we would identify around specific issues that were affecting Muslim women in South Africa, but also tradi- women that came from a traditional background um, and gleaming from sort of patriarchal readings of culture and how that affected women who were presented with multiple choices. And once they crossed the threshold of their home, those dynamics changed mm. um, and the structures would bear down on them in different ways. So I wanted to interrogate that from the inside. Um, and so if I really, really go back to um, my trajectory as a student, I studied architecture. Okay. And then went on into a BA. So I did my entire um, sort of architectural degree and then decided, but, you know, I was hanging out with these psych students and these sociology students and there was something that I felt I was missing. I wanted to interrogate further. Um, and, and sociology, I was like a kid in a candy store once I got into sociology Um and I had the most fantastic supervisor who understood, understood where I was going with this because when I first presented my research for Daughters of Diamonds to the panel, um, I was told, how does this have any bearing on the South African space? Uh, because it was seen as niche. And Prof. Pozzoli was someone who said, but this is exactly why this is needed because mm-hmm. it's not being seen out there. It's not, you know, she, she sort of really, I think, um, uh, push boundaries in terms of the kind of research output that that anyone who worked under her could could sort of put out there, and so um, I definitely take my hat off to visionary sort of academics before us. It wasn't sort of this queen bee mentality to say somebody's coming in here and pushing these boundaries, and and I really felt that uh, that made a difference to how my research progressed through the years. Um, uh, Daughters are diamonds. I I didn't actually imagine that it would be a book someday. And um, the Sunday Tribune actually had a manuscript competition and I sent it in. And what I had done is I had been working as a research assistant at um, Community Agency for Social Inquiry 
But I also come from a corporate family background. And there was a point where I rejoined the family business. And it's it's considered sort of contradictory in a way, sort of this sociologist joining capitalist space, having been groomed for it to a certain degree. But I think that becoming a publisher later on also builds from this, from this experience of being in business um, in that sense as well. Um, so in the meanwhile, I didn't want my academic life to suffer. I continued writing articles. I continued with research. And I sent this manuscript in, in and it was picked up by a publisher um, at the time. And um, and we did what, sort of a hybrid publishing initiative. And this is how Daughters of Diamonds was born. Um, and it wasn't well received. It was seen as something of a colossal, um, perhaps an eye-opener. Um, but I remember when it was launched in April 27, 2007, um, I was a budding new writer. I just wanted everyone to love what I was putting out there. I was standing at my launch in Cape Town, and I got a call from Durban because it's a far more traditionalist space. And it was a Friday afternoon at Juma that this book was being held up at the Juma Khutba, and, and some of the speakers were saying, don't read this book, ban Ooh. this book. Um, and I was devastated. Because I wanted people to read and engage. No, I wanted people to love it. I just, mm-hmm. you know, it wasn't very sort of... Um, but it was the best experience I could have hoped for because on the one hand, it made me stand up for what I'd written, and what I what I believed in. And uh, they say there's no such thing as negative uh-huh. marketing. And this book is 20 years old. No, 17 years old. And um, it's still sort of out there, you know... Um, being read and being engaged and being critiqued, which is more important. Um, and that has been the, the basis for everything I've done beyond that, because my fiction has grown from, from those ideas as well. That's fascinating because I think if you've written something that can upset the establishment, God, then you've really done something. You've really written something powerful. I've never written anything that's upset anyway. I'm suddenly <laughs> feeling quite substandard. <laughs> I think um, what's been interesting for me is that it was also about the timing because I haven't written anything that was necessarily offensive, but I was interrogating questions around various, you know, forms of identity, how much of uh, transparency there is around rights and responsibilities that in particular Muslim women have um, and whether those are understood in particular ways, in specific ways as well. Um, and I find that that has changed. I think that this generation is far more adept and insistent on discussing certain issues and certain concerns, bringing them out in the open um, and standing up for what we believe in, but also um, in terms of not shying away from um, uh, being alternate, uh, you know, opening up identity issues that might not be seen as mainstream or acceptable. So I think those are sort of the important dynamics that have arisen of from years of um, uh, maybe self-introspection as a community and as individuals as well. Um, and those are important as well. So when you were shining a light on aspects of community that were perhaps uncomfortable for some readers – and maybe you got negative pushback. Was there ever a time when you considered pulling back, restraining yourself, not saying everything you wanted to say, um, trying to be sort of more of a, a people pleaser? Did any of that go through your mind or, or did it just make you more determined? I think the initial response was, I've done my book now. I think I'll just let it out there and let it be do its thing. Um, but what what had happened was this was also initiated by an interview I'd done at one of the KZN newspapers, and I can't remember which one it was, um, but um, the journalist at the time hadn't read the book. Mm-hmm. And that art- in, in, in that article, she was a young journalist who had conflated this book with something that had written by a writer called Yasmin Ali by Brown in London, who was actually uh, what she had called a um, an ex-Muslim. So she was sort of interrogating why she had left the fold of Islam and she was looking at her experiences. And this was then conflated with that. Oh, so goodness. it was unfortunate because the message of this book was lost in, in that rhetoric, sort of, you know, I mean, to each their own, but I was just mm-hmm. saying it would, it, it could have been better sort of analyzed against it instead of conflated with it. Um, so that particular newspaper, um, allowed me a right of response. 
And that broke me out of that, that sort of initial freeze state that I'd gone mm. into. Um, and, and, and the right of response was well received. It was engaged by whoever had written to the, um, the, the newspaper at the time. They were, that, at the time, letters to the editor mm. and lots of complaints and that sort of thing, which was great. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize it at the time, but engagement is always great. Yeah. Um, and so coming out of that, I had learned then in the launches as well to be clear about what I was intending and what I was doing with this research and what had come of it was writing not just sort of the dusty academic stuff that sits on the shelf, but the fiction, the short stories, the, the you know, the poetry um, subsequently, which started off as a blog called Memoirs for Kimia. Um, and it was published two years later in the form of a little book. Um, and all of this was just my first experimental foray into publishing because Memoirs for Kimia was self-published. And then I created a brand for publishing based on that. I think that was the first time we met mm-hmm. um, at the launch of Memoirs for Kimia. And, and I remember that um, it was a very empowering experience because I learned, you know, coming from a sort of manufacturing background, I learned that this was... And and I know it's terrible now to be sitting in a sort of literary podcast talking about the book as just a product, but it isn't because you're putting mm. a lot of your emotion behind creating this and wanting it to see an audience that will intercept it in certain ways. Um, and I think it's been it's become less about really and un- really preempting what those responses will be, mm-hmm. and more about just putting focus into um, content that will just be seen as authentic and and find its own audience instead. You know, so. And how difficult has it been that, that move from writing as an academic and then writing a kind of academic but readable and then into fiction? Like what advice would you give an academic who wants to do the same thing as you? Oh, that's a great question because I think it's been so much a part of my journey is that obviously academic writing is sort of this – um, you know, noting down, uh, fact finding and discussing and analyzing and in a way easier, uh, with respect to, you know, all of, you know, colleagues and, and, acad- and people in the academy. But I think that it's more difficult to take that leap out and to actually create this third dimension, um, of characters and spaces and being able to not just visualize, but authentically place your characters feel what they're feeling um, and create the experience for your reader. You almost have this contract of trust with your reader. And I think if you get that wrong, you can so easily win that, uh, lose that mm. trust. So Sophia took me a long time to write. It was my first novel soon after Daughters Are Diamonds. I relied a lot on the data that I had gotten from those interviews with women that I'd done through that time. Um, and I knew that the story of gender-based violence need to be written up. But it was difficult because I had to not only place myself in my character's shoes, um, but to assimilate that data and not just be the one standing outside analyzing it, but to suddenly say, well, um, how do I present this in the way that my reader gets a feel for it without thinking that I'm sort of telling everything mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. one go? And it took a lot of cleanups, years of cleanups, because the initial manuscripts that are sitting there um, are heavy and loaded. And I remember having a dream about it one day when I thought I was just being, you know, I felt like I was standing in front of a block of concrete. So you've got all this content, but of what use is it if it's just a block of concrete? Mm-hmm. And I had a dream of a washing line with bags of water um, being pinned to the washing line. And all of these bags of water were just heavy. Um, and I needed to find a way to pierce them so that they would flow and um and that was the vision that stayed with me in the cleanup process in one of the rewriting processes where i finally felt like the story was coming to life um and i think it took me four or five years of writing to finally be at a place where sophia was clean enough to let it out there um, and it was edited by Louis Greenberg at the time all right so it was great working with somebody who had insight and it just sort of burst those water balloons for mm. me. <laughs> if you need someone to burst a, a water balloon, Louis is the person for you. <laughs> um, Shafinaz, I want to ask you about place as a factor in your novels. I'm thinking of 
Johannesburg, which is almost like a character in the novel The Economics of Love and Happiness, that the dirt and grit and grime and the hustle culture of Johannesburg um, almost becomes a character. And now I know your upcoming novel, which will be published by Quela later this year, Darlings of Durban, is set in Durban. Is that right? I, I don't yet know much about the book, but I presume it's set in Durban. It is. And I just want to know, have you lived in both places and how have you used place as a factor in your novels? Thank you for that question. I think place is definitely, um, I get a feel for place. I've never written about a place that I've never been to, or not yet anyway. Um, and um, I grew up in um, what was called Petersburg, Mm -hmm. um, but as a young adult, I moved to Johannesburg and this is where I really started finding myself and who I was. Um, and so my relationship with the city in so many ways, um, inspired me to just, you know, um, f to find who I was, to discover myself in so many ways, um, to make enduring friendships and have relationships that were meaningful. And, um, and really, you know, all of my writing, especially with Sophia and the economics of love and happiness and some of my short stories are uh, exploring parts of Johannesburg. But from traveled, um, and in my books, I do sort of travel to some parts of the world that I've been. And I find, um, the, the thing that we miss out on as South Africans is we don't claim the streets enough. Mm. Um, you know, I always say when you travel and when you really not, you don't use the transport, you just get out there. Um, with a good pair of walking shoes and you really experience the city and the town and the street. And we don't get to do that enough in South Africa, even though we live here. Well, I don't anyway. Even though we live here and we don't get to see enough unless we're just sort of whizzing past in our cars. Um, and I felt that by writing, I was able to step back and really sense um, what was happening around me in the city. It made me see the city differently. Um, not just documenting what I'd already observed, but it, I started to have a fresh look at what was happening on the street and wonder what was happening behind the scenes of the people that I saw really claiming the streets in a way that I, I wish I could better be involved in. Um, and so I started writing that into my stories and really exploring Johannesburg. I have lived in Durban as well. I, I lectured at UKZN some years ago. Um, a, a course based on Daughters of Diamonds, both at Wits and at UKZN. Um, but I've been um, up and down to Durban often because my grandmother lives out there, my maternal grandmother um, lives out there. And especially now that she hasn't been traveling these last few years, I make regular visits. So I find that when I am in Durban, it's not as um, uh, a visitor. I, I get into the everyday life of whatever whatever's meant to be done in the household and I experience whatever's meant to be experienced there the way I would here. So if I'm grocery shopping or looking for specific items that she might need, um, I enjoy observing people around me and what happens and uh, maybe comparing um, the, the provinces and the cities and the reactions that people have and the prices because it's <laughs> like you're in a different place when you're grocery shopping yes, I've in Overport. This. And when you're here, um, you know, getting your checker 6060 dropped off or something. And so I noticed those little things. And also what's available to you and how people interact with you is different. So there are these nuances that needed to come through. And when I spent almost a month with her um, at the end of 2022, and um, I just ended up writing Darlings of Durban, which had been brewing in my mind for a while, Um and what had happened was I had sent the economics of love and happiness out to a few publishers before COVID, um, probably around 2017, and then eventually ended up publishing. It was then called Love Like Mangoes, and there's a story behind that. Um, at one of my birthdays on my Facebook post, a fellow writer wrote something about uh, wishing me a love that flowed like juice down my, my arms, and I wrote the title Love Like Mangoes and developed a story based on that. Um, and then eventually published it as The Economics of Love and Happiness. And after COVID, I got a write back from the editor at Quella who said, do you still have love like mangoes? We'd like to relook at it. This was now five years later. And I said, I don't. It's been published, but I do have a new manuscript. And she very happily, you know, sort of presented it. And this is where we act. We're ready to, 
Um, in fact, they've just held the first copy in their hands yesterday, so I'm very excited <laughs> about that. But but it's a different book. Even though I've experienced play story, I know I've gone in so many directions with this question. Even though I've experienced and documented place in Darlings of Durban, it comes back to my writing about women because it focuses on four women friends um, who grew up together and we see them experiencing such different aspects of their lives living in Durban. And so while I celebrate Durban as one of the characters in this novel, um, it really, for me, does come back to the stories of women and how they experience life and how life sort of impacts on them and what happens through this story and through them, just in a very different way from what I've written before. You've also published in a very different way before because you've self-published, as I understand. So The First Daughters of Diamonds was a co-publishing venture. And then from what I understand, the rest of your books have been self-published and you've actually started a publishing company. Yes. Talk us through that decision and about starting a publishing company. So um, publishing Daughters of Diamonds was um, very instructive in many ways and, and it taught me... Um, that it wasn't also just about putting a product out there the way I'd been used to in other business ventures, but that it was about putting myself out there. And that was uh, very different because you suddenly need to be in front, not just behind the scenes and handing out sort of perspectives on what your targets were and that sort of thing. So um, Daughters of Diamonds expected me then to take the forefront, to speak about what I was writing, and then to see how the audience responded to that. Um Writing the blog and then presenting Memoirs for Kimya was a, a bit of a labor of love, but it was experimental, as I said, the first book that I'd put out there from Word, what was then Wordfire Press. Um, and then I, I put out a call for short stories. I had been writing short stories, and I didn't know if I wanted to put it out there just yet. I was writing them for myself. But I put out a, a call for short stories, and we called it the... Belly of Fire, um, Stories for Social Change, because I wanted stories that reflected certain aspects of social issues. I was so sort of bent at the time on just documenting what we were seeing out there, this whole perspective of being the sociologist and um, writing what was being observed and documenting it for research purposes and discussions around how we can make the world a better place um, coming out in the form of these short stories. And, and I received a, a good amount of, of submissions and we edited. I edited along with a friend and Belly of Fire was the next publication. So organically, this publishing um, initiative started to grow and I got submissions from other authors. Um, a very interesting book called um, You Are Your Deepest Strength by Vusi Gianna was a young student at UJ. Uh, who came to me with his manuscript, and he talks about coming from the township and being a first-generation, first-time student at UJ. And I thought it was a powerful book to want to publish on his part because it would have presented like the Big Brother um, document for other students at mm -hmm. UJ or you know whoever he was encountering at the time to say, but this is how you go about being mm -hmm. in the big city and getting transport and not getting... Um, thrown out by your landlord and that sort of thing. All the sort of pitfalls that a young person would would, would face came out in that book. And then a few years later, um, Sophia, my novel, um, was published. And I was also insistent on when I'd realized that um, it needed to also take on um, a look and feel that was acceptable the way that you know, books are mm. generally mm. published. And so I started learning about the type of paper and outsourcing correct um, sort of end, uh, people that could work on design and typesetting and learning about those things as mm. well and sort of taking this more seriously. And then around 2014, um, Sophia was published in 2012, around 2014, um, I had the big publishing experience when um, Kanita Hunter was writing a blog, she was a, a young reporter at the time, and she was writing a blog called Diary of a Goody Girl, sort of just to take her out of the every day that she was reporting on, the sort of mm -hmm. on-the-ground heavy stuff that she called it. And she wrote a, a blog called Diary of a Goody Girl about a young Muslim girl going to campus and the pitfalls that she experienced. And she would write a regular post, and this was just getting great readership until mm -hmm. she hit like 2 million um, hits on her blog wow. and she came up to me and she said 
do you think we could do something with this? And I said, we could turn it into a novel. And we took about 50 of the main sort of posts that would give us a, a broad idea of what was happening, edited it, put it into a manuscript and published it. And in the first, we, we decided to print 500 copies. And in the first weekend, those books were gone. Wow. I'd never seen anything like it, especially as a small publisher. Um, and it was December, I remember, which is also like the taboo time to, to launch mm. a book. Um, and the printers are not, you know, willing to print mm. more copies. So I got somebody in my hometown who wasn't familiar with publishing books to print a quick thousand because we needed them for an upcoming festival in Durban. And everyone in Durban wanted to read this book because she was from mm. Durban. And by January, the, the sort of original pu- printer said, well, we can get you more books. And this book just snowballed. Wow. 2015, it just, you know, grew and grew and grew. Um, and then also, as with hype books, it also died at a certain point. It was a beautiful experience from a publishing perspective, from a business perspective, but from a writer's perspective as well, and from a reader's perspective as well, to see how um, hype books work to see how you can grow your readership through blogging, um, to see how the dynamic was changing at that time. It was a very specific time where if you were bl- blogging before that, you weren't necessarily reaching an audience. But suddenly everyone was on their mm. phones mm. reading blogs and sa- sh- sharing blogs and sending on blogs. I think you've done, Fiona, you've done a lot of that. I'm not familiar if you have mm. as well. So it was just um, being at the right place at the right time, I suppose. And... Um, Subsequently, I launched the Nisa Kama series, which is also published by Word Flute Press. And that's going into the schools and Gauteng. Um, it's commended at the libraries in Gauteng. So it's it's been a, a great experience wow. so far. Wow. And what has it been like now moving into the more traditional publishing route with the new book coming out with Quela? Has it sort of been a completely different experience? Um, it, it did give me a lot to think about. And, um, you know, there was a moment where I thought, I'm so used to having complete control over the process and the profiteering. So um, I, I did consider that um, it was something that I would have probably jumped at 10 years ago as not knowing the space. Mm. And knowing the space, you, you just start to question, uh, you know, certain perspectives. And so I spoke to one or two authors who were in both spaces. Mm-hmm. Um, this this book is edited by Ilana Brigan, and she's somebody that I often defer to as you know for advice. and And she was um, sort of she said, "Look, you you know how to do this thing, so you know what you're taking into the space. But if you have a collaboration with someone who's been there as well, it's not you know it's not that you'd be um, shortchanging yourself in any way." So that was her 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 uh, advice. Also, I think after COVID, a lot has changed about how we distribute and the audiences we reach. So I don't think collaborative efforts would be a bad thing, you know, in any way. Um, and to be fair, um, they've given me a lot of control over how the book looks and what goes in and what doesn't go in. And I'm very comfortable with um, how the process turned out. I was skeptical. I was um, a little resistant. It took me a while to decide. Um, but I'm very happy. I'm about to see how it's how it's going to turn out, and I'm very happy that um, that it's turned out the way it did. And uh, I think it's going to be a good year. It's going to be. Exciting. There's a lot to look forward to. Um, let's talk about the Nisa yes. Kamar series, because you know, for the last 15 years, there has been an awareness that. South African children need to be able to see themselves in books. And I think there was a while there where there were a few books that had black children as characters and publishers tended to think, okay, job done. You know, we've got uh, books for black children. No need to do anything more. Um, but there are so many highly specific communities in South Africa And children in those communities who really need to see themselves. Mm. And I see your series as kind of answering that need for more niche stories that emerge from a very specific culture. So is is that the kind of need that you are trying to fill by writing those books? 
So when I first wrote in 2016 Nisa 1, which was Nisa Kamar in the Master of Genial, I wanted to document a story that I'd never seen in text, especially in South Africa, which was the story of jinn. You know, so you see stories about zombies and spirits and gulls and specters, but I hadn't seen, aside from reading William Dalrymple's City of Jinn, which he calls, he refers to Delhi. It was a story about Delhi, but he calls it City of Jinn. Um, because there's this cultural rhetoric and cultural dialogue that doesn't come through when you're speaking um, sort of generally. It's sort of these hushed undertones and the reason why we don't do this and the reason why we don't do that or the reason why, you know, the, the elders used to say, don't wear perfume when you go out at night because you can attract the unseen. And those were saw these fascinating stories that went around and never got interrogated. And I wanted to put that into a story. But I wanted to write for children. Mm-hmm. Um, so Nisa starts off as this 10-year-old little girl growing up in Johannesburg with a single mom because I wanted to talk about, you know, the struggles of being the eldest girl child in a single mom household and what happens around that and the dynamic of interacting with single parents and younger siblings. But in the first story, there was also this um, this element of the unseen, the unspoken, the unworded that needed to be worded. Mm -hmm. And even in the story, it's sort of, you know, we don't use the word. So she calls them the J-folk. I made up the word J-folk. You don't say jinn because you might attract attention that you don't want. And, um, and it's, and it's written in a light way. It's not written in a way that, you know, somebody's going to be killed or whatever the case might be. Um, I wanted to write it in a way that uh, opened up the space to, but if there's a whole collection of, there's a whole population of unknowns out there. How do you interact? And how, and I, and I suggest that Nisa has a gift and she's able to interact, um, with something that not everyone can see. Because if you keep your heart open, you open yourself to experiences that aren't always there. So there's this whole, um, sub story to the story. And that's how, I, when I first started writing Nisa Kerman and the Master of Genieville, I didn't, um, intend to write a sequel. I didn't intend that there might be a sequel. I intended for this story to be written in a particular way. Oh, interesting. Mm. And it, it's almost like the character demanded it of me mm. to grow with me because in every year now I just went with the school year that she's 11 mm. and then 12 and then 13 and then 14 in this one. And talk to us about that challenge of writing for that age group, writing for, because I I understand how to write for a small child and I understand how to write for an adult, but I don't even know how one begins to write for that middle school, I suppose, would be the correct label. How did you do that? Um, it's it's not easy, um, but I learned by interacting with uh, my own nieces and nephews and um, and watching and observing what they were reading and writing as well. And I also noticed the lack of material. So that was the other perspective which you spoke about and I didn't address, that um, there wasn't material that they could identify with directly. And they were reading a lot of what I'd re- read when I was younger, mm-hmm. the Enid Blytons and the Judy Blooms and beautiful material. Um, I know with Mediha, I introduced her to your Trinity series and she loved it and Hamilton series as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it, you know, this, these ideas were then billowing that, Local material was fascinating, and still there was this deeper niche that needed to be uh, um, sort of gotten involved and delved into. And I started writing Nisa with that kind of feel that I would develop a character that was... Um, I, I don't think that, you know, she, she uh, Nisa is not a character, and I've realized this, that children wouldn't be able to identify with if they weren't Muslim. Mm. But I also wanted to bring in those perspectives that were particular and familiar to Muslim girls reading or Muslim boys reading this book. And, um, and, and this is how Nisa Kamar was born. Are your nieces and nephews your first readers for that series? And, and how has the series been received generally? They are, and they're highly critical because they've, mm-hmm. they've sort of owned the series in many ways. So when they read, they tell me, but this or that. And, and I think with cover three, they were like, but this is not how Nisa is supposed to look. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, so they had already developed in their minds now how Nisa looks and why I've, why I've deviated. Um, and so, uh, I get, um, very genuine feedback when, when they feel that I've done something that just doesn't make sense or, or that sort of thing. 
And, um, and not only that, um, they've asked if later on in life, when I'm tired of writing the Nisa Kummer series, if they can continue to write oh, wow. parts of the series. So I'm very fascinated by that idea that they can think to write further. Um, and I love the idea that they can see themselves on the cover of a book, that their name can be seen because it's something that, um, you know, wasn't sort of obvious to me that, you know, one day you could have your name on the cover of a book. Um, so I think that would be, that would be great as well. They've grown, so they're reading very differently now. Mm-hmm. Um, but the Nisa, the Nisa series has, uh, has developed its own audience as well. You know, so I have people coming up to me at family weddings or at, um, school functions and saying, I've already read one, two, three, and four. When is five coming out? Right. You know, so I'm happy to see that happening as well. And do you see it continuing and continuing, or do you think it's going to come to a natural end? I wonder about that because I've been trying to write book five for a very long time, and the others ah. haven't taken that long. So I'm beginning to feel like Nisa has outgrown her series for now, and I'll, I'll only get back to it when I really have a feel for for the book to be able to write it. So. Very interesting, because I think that is a big challenge in writing a series is how do you know when you've come to the end of the series, um, I've got no idea. Um, so, yeah, that's quite, that, that you've run out of the energy for it in a way. So it's very interesting. Well, I'd like to pose that question to Fiona mm-hmm. then because yeah. you've got great experience with developing series. So, yeah, I, I think when I start a series, I already have the end in mind. Um, of the whole series? Yes. I have an idea, okay, this Show is off. going to be a four-book series or this is going to be a six-book series because in watching TV and also reading my own favorite novels, I found that nothing disappoints me more than the writer keeping going after the series should have been allowed to end because then they they just are spoiling it. They're taking this thing which is a favorite of mine and that I love dearly and they are now spoiling it. Okay. They're just keeping it going when the momentum should actually have stopped. So because I always love the ideas that I'm starting with, I don't want to spoil them by just writing them out and, and keeping going when right. the momentum isn't there. So I almost always have an end in mind from the beginning and have an idea of how many books it's going to take to get there. Do you see me looking ashamed and laughing at myself? <laughs> as I write a series with a friend. We co-write a cozy mystery series. Okay. We're going to write that as long as people buy it. We see no end in sight. <laughs> but there are some stories that have a kind of perpetual momentum. You know, they they can just keep going. And I think that Julia Bird is one of those. I yeah. hope so, because we're planning to make Julia have adventures until she's about 97 years old. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. And so your audience grows with your series in that way as well. I expect so. Well, I mean, Julia's already 60. So, right. um, I expect, I think, the, I think the audience might remain this, the <laughs> same, but ho- hopefully, you know, it's also a challenge having ideas for the same character right. to keep, to keep having the same character have new adventures. And, and I think it, I imagine writing for younger, younger readers that that's even more challenging in a way because they're quite demanding as readers and and they look forward to seeing that you can stretch the boundaries as well they don't Mm -hmm. just want a sort of okay she always does this and she Mm -hmm. always does that she goes to school and she comes back home um and i found that with book two the rainbow healer society i went a little philosophical and i started looking at bullying in the classroom and it wasn't as much of an adventure as the master of Ginevale. And while it was re- it was received better by older readers, um, like the um, the debating societies at the clients of the state, the prisons used it as um, a book to talk about rehabilitation, and there were stories about moving through uh, forgiveness and that sort of thing within that book, the Rainbow Healers. Um, but it was it was sort of the younger readers who were like, even though she's eleven, this, some of the ideas weren't sort of fun. You know, necessarily. Mm-hmm. And then with book three, um, The Legend of Kothar, they do this um, excursion. The kids go on an excursion to Cape Town with their class. And there's an experience along the way. Um, and Cape Town is known for these sessions where they sit together and they have um, the Hadra, which is like a remembrance of God. So they do like the, a chant 
mm-hmm. in the middle of the winelands, and it's quite a beautiful experience. And they stop the, the bus on the side of the road, and they have this experience. And little dates with coconut are handed out on a platter, which is, um, you know, what happens at these events. And then rose milk because something sweet is served in that event. And the kids have this sort of experience of the fun stuff, which is the sweets and the rose mm-hmm. milk. Um, and along the way, Nisa is reading a book, a novel called The Legend of Kothar. So it's a novel within the novel. And it's an ancient novel that she's reading. And there's a, a moral in that story which plays out in what she experiences uh, in The Legend of Kothar. And I'm relying on sort of an archetypal story, a Muslim story, a Sufi story, in fact, and bringing that into The Legend of Kothar and what what happens in the classroom situation. Um and that was the book that was shortlisted for the Sunlam Prize, but didn't get sort of published there. So we published it at Word Flute as the third in the series. And finally, the circle of the astrolobe looks at artificial intelligence to a degree. And the astrolobe is an ancient timepiece that also refers to Sufi literature. A lot of Rumi's poetry refers to the astrolobe. And I bring it into this modern story. Um, and it's an adventure story where the children have to save Johannesburg from freezing in time um, when a green gr- a green gas takes over. And it actually refers to envi- an environmental hazard which we are being faced with, just not visually. It's not a green mm. gas. Uh, but acid mine drainage is affecting the city um, from underneath. And the children have to then find a way to, to recover the city before it freezes over. So... You it's, talk it's about um, getting your books into schools and into mm. prisons and other places. Now, you don't have a vast marketing machine behind you. Mm. For a lot of your career, you've been one person, but you have nevertheless been very successful at getting your books in front of readers and getting into the literary festivals, um, being entered for awards, mm you know, it, it being widely reviewed and widely read. Um, how have you done that? Has that been purely your own initiative? That was exactly my next question. So in the beginning, it really was because I looked at it uh, entirely from um, a business perspective, you know, and from just getting something out into the space, into the market. Um, but, uh, and so quite early on, it was, you know, in exclusive books and that sort of thing. But later on, especially when um, I had more titles to deal with, it wasn't just me being the agent behind my books, but it was about um, engaging a proper distributor, getting a mm-hmm. marketing sort of team, um, handle, someone to handle publicity and, and that sort of thing. So it it was a learning curve outsourcing all the required aspects of being involved. But as soon as one gets into the media space, it, there is an organic kind of where uh, someone who's interviewed you will call you back and say, you've got a new book this year, let's have a look at it. It was also about the consistency of bringing out books mm-hmm. um, that created that momentum where the media space was, okay, Shofinaz has got a new book, we'd like to have you online or we'd like to have you on air or let's do an interview or do you have a review copy? Um, and, and so it was really organic in that sense. And yet I had a structure in mind and I felt my way through and just, um, it, it did snowball in a way. And I had the help of really great advice, friends in the industry, um, you know, people who had already been there and done that, uh, conversations that I'd had. And, um, you know, I think relying on the network and the friendships that you make in the space and being able to extend your own advice and your own help in certain ways grows the network. Because the South African publishing space, whether you are traditionally or self-published or independently published, does rely on those connections and those networks, authentic connections where you can rely on each other. It's not about what you can get. It's also what you can give. And if you learn something or there's a pitfall and you share it, I think it helps in that space as well because you get um, younger writers or, or newer writers coming up to you and saying, I have this and this and this issue. Mm. Can you, you know, sort of help me get around it? Um, and and I think that really builds on, um, it's not just about paying per use and getting something out of it. It is about building those networks as well. It helps you get out there. And then it's about audience-specific um, material. So, If you are writing for children, it's natural that you're going to go into the schools and launch them. A book launch at a bookstore is not necessarily going to Mm. reach who you want to reach. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And then the schools are looking for content all the time. So they invite you back and say, well, come back for Reader's Week. We want to hear your story. And you grow your audience in that way because you're presenting something that would appeal. I find with the NISA series, though, even though I had an adult audience to begin with, and NISA's only um, six or seven years old now, um, I found that my adult readers were reading it because of how much I referred to aspects of my childhood mm-hmm. um, and sort of the, the cultural dialogue around why you should cover your hair, why you should close your curtains at, at sunset, you know, the things that we spoke about but were never really documented are in here and uh, things to do in the week before the, the, you know, the lead up to Eid, for example, little silly things that we talk about um, across the table but weren't in a story. And when those started getting engaged and people were like, but we want our children to know about this. Oh, and Mm. I remember that. I remember that. So there was a nostalgia that came through the stories. And I think story has a powerful way of doing that. Mm. Um, That made me realize that Nisa wasn't just about the entertainment or uh, presenting this character of the now, but it was also about reaching back into the the innocence and the familiarity um, that many of my generation hadn't read and were sort of, probably always wondered if they would ever read themselves in those stories. So one of the many things you do is you have your own book show, Book Bites. Can you tell us about that, how it works, where do people find it and what you do on that? So um, around, uh, you know, just when lockdown started, Salam Media called me up and said they've got a slot. You know, the festivals were closing down and, um, you know, they said, do you want to do something with the time? And I decided to review books. And at the time, it wasn't about new books necessarily coming out, but we had just, just such a wealth of books already available and um, and a lot of time on my hands, obviously. So I started off with two books a week, two shows a week, and it's now down to one. Um, and what I do is it's a half an hour online virtual studio program where I interview um, local and international authors about what's current, what they're writing or what they have written. Um, I focus less on writer process, although I like li- listening to stories <laughs> around the writers and more about um, the current book so mm. that it's out there. Um, I prefer the 25-minute slot. I think it's easy to just disseminate and everyone sort of, you know, gets into it. Um, and basically that's how Book Bites has grown. And, and where do and people find it? Um, Book Bites is on SoundCloud and on Salam Media, which has its own audio stream website, and it streams through Facebook Live, Twitter Live, and the the usual pages. Um, and it's available on the Salam Media YouTube page as well. So there's little bites to be had if you want to see what's been out there. And do you do video as well as audio? So do you have a camera filming you? So it's not a camera that's filming. We use um, something very similar to Zoom called mm-hmm. uh, StreamYard. So um, wherever the author is, they log in from their side on a link and we log in from our side and it streams through Facebook Live and YouTube Live and mm-hmm. then it's it's there for posterity. Um, so it works out quite quite fine that way. Well, I'm sure you have to read lots of new content mm-hmm. for that every week. So can you tell us what you have been reading or watching or listening to lately that's made an impression on you? So um, during the holidays, I actually read something that isn't very new. It was um, Trevor Noah's memoir called Born a Crime, and I really Uh, enjoyed that Mm -hmm. um, because of the perspective that it gave. You know, um, we have this idea of Trevor as this great export out there doing comedy, but bringing up some hard-hitting issues as well. Um, and it was humbling to read his story from the ground up. So I enjoyed that. I really enjoyed some of his uh, um, essays because it's written in a form in mm. the form of essays. And then recently I read something that was sent for uh, possible review. Um, it's called Same as Ever. It's an international author. But what I liked is it's an, it's a nonfiction book that talks about risk, managing risk and getting the most out of life, but preempting certain aspects of life as well. Mm-hmm. So it was really interesting. Um, I don't remember the author's name. It's called Same as Ever. And um, a book that I look forward to reviewing is um, local author Shabnam Khan has come up with um, mm-hmm. The Lost Love of Akbar Manzil. I think lo- internationally it's being published as 
uh, the gin waits a hundred years. Yes. So I think this is fantastic because a local author now again has got this global deal and um, it would be amazing to see how far she goes with her story as well. She think, has written very successfully before. I think that book is going to be the book everyone's talking about this season. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You're our second guest who's mm. mentioned that as the mm. book that they either just read or are looking forward to right. reading. So I think it is going to be big. It's, it's exciting because it's been a while. Also, her her novel, Onion Tears, did very well, mm-hmm. um, her debut novel. And um, and it's a story about gin, so I'm really looking mm-hmm. forward to getting mm-hmm. into it because, again, it delves into aspects of story that um, we don't have a lot of written in South Africa. So I remember she wrote a modern love story that was published in the New York Times which was a story about her relationship with her parents. Okay. And it was one of the most amazing essays I have ever read. It has stayed with me. It's remarkable, and I can't wait to read her new book. And we also have very high hopes for Darlings of Durban. Do you have a release date for it yet? Um, I know they said early February because books mm-hmm. have just been printed. I'm waiting to receive at least a copy. And um, launches are set for February. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we've got some tentative dates for mid to late February. Um, and those will come out soon enough. So we should be in bookstores in early Feb. Fantastic. Well, we are really looking forward to it. And I think by the time this podcast airs, it will already be on the shelves. Yes. So we urge all our readers to get hold of it and give it a try. And thank you so much for your time, Shafinaz. This has been great. Thank you, Fiona and Gail, for having me on your show. I had had a great time as well. Wow, Gail, what a powerhouse Shafinaz is. What an impressive person. Extraordinary, extraordinary. I'm really taken with her... Her multi abilities, an academic, a writer, a businesswoman. And I'm really, the thing I took out of that was how extraordinarily she has approached the self publishing journey. And I wonder if it's that she didn't know that what she was doing was extraordinary. You know, to just, I'll just start a publishing business in order to publish my books and then has made it work in a way that very few self-published writers manage. It's hard. The marketing, the getting it out there, the getting it into schools. She said that like it was nothing. Yeah. And that's hard. So very motivated by that, that if you have the energy and the vision, maybe you can achieve more than you think you can. Yes. What I took out of it is that if doors appear to be closed to you, create your own opportunities. Mm. I think right now in the literary space in South Africa is the best time to do that, to just make things happen Mm. for yourself. If you've received a no from somebody, you can turn that into a yes Mm. through your own efforts. Mm. That's so important, I think, that, you know, the publishing world in South Africa is quite small. Yes, it is. So if you're getting rejections, it doesn't mean your book doesn't have a market. Yes, Yes. It might mean your book doesn't have a market, <laughs> but it doesn't necessarily mean your book doesn't have a market. Yes, yes. And and Shafinaz has really just opened up a whole niche of writing for Muslim women mm. that didn't exist before. She has created it, made it happen, and she's turned her opportunities into opportunities mm. for other writers, mm. which is just a, a, a generosity of spirit that has really worked for her. A hundred percent. And Gail, do you have writing advice for us this week? So my writing advice for this week is something that anyone who knows me very well will be a bit surprised by. That when you are stuck, maybe what you need to do is exercise. And I I really am very vehemently (laughs) anti-exercise. I think exercise is very dangerous and you can hurt yourself when you exercise. So you must do it very carefully. But often that... That going into the physical, taking a walk. When I say exercise, I don't mean anything too hectic. Take a walk. Mm -hmm. That movement can often unstick something in your brain. And I'm planning on a big walk tomorrow to try and unstick my brain. Do you walk on your own or do you walk and chat with a friend? Which one works better? For writing, being alone works better. I'm not sure what I'm doing tomorrow because I do the park run apparently it is I do a park walk Mm -hmm. um when I when I do it alone I find it very valuable for my writing yeah no I agree I do that as well and it works wonders for me and your advice for the week well it's drawing on something that Shafina said about how 
in her Nisa books, she chose to write down things that had never been written down mm. before, things that were highly specific to her community, just little conversations, I gather, largely between women, mm. things passed on between sisters, between mm. mothers and daughters, little things that are said that don't actually exist in the written mm. word up till now. And I can imagine people thinking, oh, this is so mundane, it's so prosaic, it's just the words that we say to each other. Mm. It's things that everybody knows. It's, it's not big enough to make its way onto the page. But she has written them down, mm. and she's quite possibly the first person to do that. And now she's getting responses from people in the community saying, oh, that's what we used mm. to say to each other. Mm. That's what my childhood was like. Mm. Oh, it's so amazing to see this on the page. So however small and every day you think that your daily experience might be try putting it on the page because you might actually be making magic for yourself and for the reader and i think as a reader often the magic is in those details that little detail that little thing that that just makes everything feel authentic and real because you know it is real exactly so we hope that everybody checks out Shafinaz's large body of work mm. and more particularly the new book, Darlings of Durban, published by Quella. It will be out in February of this year. So by the time this podcast is available, it will already be on shelves. I'm dying to read it and I think everyone should pick up a copy. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.